Well, it's good to be with you again. Let's grab our Bibles if we can and turn over to the book of Deuteronomy. The book of Deuteronomy and we'll head over to chapter 30. But before we read our passage for this morning, I need you to help me in your imagination with an illustration this morning. Uh, often, uh, if we had gone on holidays as a family, uh, we'd often head towards the coast. And if we found a nice secluded beach, uh, maybe go for a bit of a swim. Now, uh, I know there's no beaches quite close to you guys here. That's why I need your imagination. If you were to be wandering down the beach and you were looking to go for a swim at a patrolled beach, what might you look for? Something set up on the sand. What's something that you would look for uh, for where you were going to swim? Flags. Flags. All right. We understand what the flags do, don't they? Uh, the lifeguards set them out and they say, this is uh, the best area for you to swim. You can swim anywhere that you'd like uh, from this point to this point. All right, and do the, do the flags mean that if I swim between them, nothing will ever happen to me? No, no. But it does mean that there is someone patrolling that area. There's someone looking out to see if there is going to be any danger. Uh, there's someone in that moment uh, making sure that uh, where they set the flags up, there's going to be the least possibility of a rip. There's going to be the least undertow. There's going to be the least amount of dumping waves. This, this is the best place for you to swim. And they've been out there. They've worked out if there's any submerged rocks. They've worked out if there's any sandbars, anything that might trip you up. And they've said, this is the best place. Swim here and we'll look after you here. Uh, if you fall down, we'll be right there to help you. Uh, if you. If you start to struggle, we'll be right there by your side and we'll help you back up. That's what it means to swim between the flags. Uh, now, if we were to swim outside of the flags, uh, does that mean and, and start to struggle? Will the lifeguard, lifeguard not come and rescue us? No, he'll still come. But it might be a little bit harder to get back. It might take a little bit more effort. Maybe you might injure yourself in the process. Uh, maybe you might uh, uh, have some mental problems after that, getting back in the water. All right. He's still going to come and help you. But they set out the flags because they say this is the place where it will be the easiest for you. And I've been there before, so I know that. That's why the lifeguard says that. And so what we're going to look at this morning, I've titled the message, Swim Between the Flags. Swim Between the Flags. Because, you know, life is very similar to that, isn't it? Now, we have a wonderful thing in that we have salvation. And we were, as we remembered this morning at the table, we remembered that God didn't even spare his own son. And when we remember the love of God, that, that's pretty special, that he sent his only son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die in our place, take a punishment that was rightly mine, pay for sin that I committed. And with his blood, we can be free from sin. That's a pretty special thing. And then not only that, Bible says there's no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. I don't need to worry about future judgment. Uh, we were told uh, it's appointed unto men once to die. After this, the judgment, you know, I don't need to worry about that because there's no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. And not only that, I have the gift of eternal life, not then, but now. I possess everlasting life now. And God, God has done some wonderful things in this gift of salvation. But there's a long time between the moment I get saved, uh, there's a lot of uh, life that I have to live before I get to be with him. And there's going to be a lot of different challenges. We don't always know what's going to happen. We don't know what is going to be injected into our life. Uh, we don't know what issues we're going to have to deal with, what situations we're going to have to deal with. But, you know, there's one who's gone that way before. And there's one who's worked out where there might be a bit of a rip. And there's one who's worked out where there's a submerged rock here. And he's plot out a course and he said, here, live your life here. Here's the parameters. Here's the boundaries. In here is the place of blessing. In here, I've got my eye on you and I will keep you safe. And so we're looking this morning, swim between the flags spiritually. 
And so if you have your spot there in Deuteronomy in chapter 30, Deuteronomy in chapter 30, we're just going to read uh, a few verses this morning. Uh, is it okay if I ask you to stand as, as we read? Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verses 15 to 20, just if you're able to stand as we respect the word of God. Uh, and it says there in verse 15, Moses <clears throat> is saying by the word of God, see, I have set before thee this day life and good death and evil and that i command thee this day to love the lord thy god to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments that thou mayest live and multiply and the lord thy god shall bless thee in the land whither thou goest to possess it but if thine heart turn away so that thou wilt not hear but shalt be drawn away and worship other gods and serve them I denounce unto you this day that ye shall surely perish, and that ye shall not prolong your days upon the land, whither thou passest over Jordan to, to go to possess it. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. And listen to this, therefore choose life, mm. that both thou and thy seed may live, that thou mayest love the Lord thy God, that thou mayest obey his voice, and that thou mayest cleave unto him for he is thy life and the length of thy days, that thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. And then we'll be seated. Our Father, Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, it's such a wonderful thing to have the very words of God in our hands. And Lord, we thank you for the spirit of God that helps us to discern them. Uh, Lord, I pray that we might be encouraged by your word this morning. Uh, Lord, I pray that you might be lifted up. I pray that we would be challenged. Uh, Lord, I do pray that we would desire to grow and draw nearer to you. So, Lord, we thank you and we ask for your help this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, you may be seated. Now, if we come back to our illustration of the flags, swimming between the flags, the area that's mapped out is one thing. But sometimes we want to know a little bit about the guy who mapped out the area, don't we? Now, it, um, just oh, it was probably a couple of months ago now, we had a, a youth camp uh, back in Sydney. A bunch of different churches or teenagers got together. And uh, I was the designated lifeguard. And we were swimming. It took about 15 minutes of hard hiking to get down. And it was just straight in the water and it was just a mess and they're like you know you're going to have about 40 at a time swimming here I'm like all right <laughs> don't really want to lose anyone on my first day uh, so I dove in and I swam around I, I wanted to have a look at what was going on there I wanted to know how deep it was I wanted to know how fast the current was going I wanted to know where all these trees and things you know uh, I don't want someone diving in and you know he's just been skewered on that and you know so you go around you have a bit of a look and that's what you do beforehand but then when they're down there at the time uh we have to constantly be patrolling don't you You have to constantly be looking you have to be constantly alert aware you know there's a bunch out over there there's a few over there and you're always scanning and alert and as we we, we expect that of our lifeguards today, don't we? We expect that when, when you go down to the pool and the kids are swimming or whatever. Uh, you expect that the lifeguard is looking, he's paying attention, he's not off having his lunch. Uh, and so when we look at our God as sort of the supreme lifeguard, uh, there's just three things before we really get started this morning that we want to, we want to establish. First is he's alert. In Psalm 121 and verse 3, Scripture says, uh, he will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. And there is a lot of comfort in the fact that the God who is looking out for me throughout my life is always on the job. It's never going to go home, never needs to take a rest. Uh, he's always there watching out. And that, that's a comforting thought, isn't it? So not only is he alert, he's able. Because if I get in a little bit of trouble, I really want to know that the guy who's been assigned to protect me can help me. And, and when I was doing my lifeguard course, to prove it, you have to, someone jumps in, jumps in the water and he's got to pretend to be dead as dead weight and you got to swim him to the other end and back 
tucked under your arm with their head out of the water because you need to be able to prove that you were able to help them. You were able, you have the ability to do that. And as we sung about it earlier, it comes uh, from scripture. Paul was saying, I'm persuaded that he, that's God, is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Jude uh, verse 24, now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. So not only uh, is, is our God alert, he's on the job, but he is able, he has the power to be able to help us throughout our course of life. And, and uh, thirdly, he is aware. Hebrews 4.15 says, we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. He swum that way before. He's figured out, ah, scratch my leg on that. Pull that out, or maybe just don't go there. That's the job of the lifeguard. So that, that's just some, some basics that we uh, set some groundwork before we get stuck in this morning. He is the one who's plotted out this course and said, this is your path. Now it's your choice. Just like Moses there, uh, he's come to uh, the children of Israel. We know that the book of Deuteronomy uh, is really basically a recap. Uh, Moses knows he's coming to the end of his time leading the, the children of Israel. They're about to embark on, on a wonderful journey, conquering the promised land, uh, something that God had promised them for many hundreds of years. And this was about to come to fruition. And so here he is giving them some, some last words. And right here, he sums it all up. And he says, you have a choice. You can choose blessing or you can choose cursing. You can choose life or you can choose death. And you know, that choice for us is, is still always the same. I can choose a path of blessing or I can choose to remove myself from that. And you look through the history of the Old Testament and you the children of Israel, at times, they're in their place of blessing. Things were going well. And then they chose to remove themselves from that. And the Lord said, well, if that's what you want, then that's what you're going to get. And it's their choice. But there is a way that's been plotted out. And Moses shows them what it is in these few verses. And now, my mind, the way my mind works, I, I like... I like things to match so that I can uh, remember them. So if you're taking notes, you can or whatever, take it or leave it. Uh, the points for this morning are going to be in the acrostic flags because we want to remember swimming between the flags. All right, so we'll have F, L, A, G, and S as our points this morning. And the very first one that I find there in this passage that Moses has described uh, is fear the Lord. Now, we don't see that specifically uh, written in the passage. But if we take the passage in the context of the book, what is the whole book of Deuteronomy all about? Well, it's a book of remembrance. And Moses is telling them, remember that you were slaves. And then remember the mighty hand of God that rescued you. And then remember how you were in the wilderness and the times that God rescued you. And remember all of these things. And, and he's, he's showing them the power of God. Because when faced with the power of God, we understand something of the fear of God. And then... He brings it all together and, he's, and he's, he's influencing them to make this choice to choose life, to choose to follow the Lord. And that is all based, that can all be summed up in, children, would you, would you choose to fear the Lord? Uh, he could have taken basically everything he said in that passage and summed it all up in, uh, Israel, would you choose to fear the Lord? And the very first thing that we need to remember as we endeavor to move through our life between the flags, something that's going to keep us between the flags is that choice to fear the Lord. Now, what does it mean to fear the Lord? We know that scripture says it's the beginning of wisdom. So we know that it's, it's very important and it's right there at the foundation of all that we should pursue and all that we should seek after and all that is good and right in the word of God. Uh, but, but what does it mean? And we don't, have, we don't have time this morning to go through entirely uh, what it is, uh, but basically a definition is it's a reverence for God that results in a hatred of sin and a desire to be holy. Uh, that's, that's basically as concise as I could sum it up in, in looking through the word of God. Uh, it's, it's a reverence of God that causes me to do two things. One, I want to steer clear of sin. And one, I want to be holy like my God is holy. Uh, and <clears throat> Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 6 says, By mercy and truth, iniquity is purged. And by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. Why is it so important to fear God, to choose to fear him right at the outset? 
Because as I understand a little bit of who God is, it keeps me away from that which causes me to sin. And I was speaking to Pastor Talbot this morning. He said he's been going through uh, some of Isaiah and chapter six, uh, where it, sorry, yeah, for Sunday school. Uh, and, and so we see there in that passage, Isaiah coming into the temple and he's confronted with the holiness of God, isn't he? And what, what's the first thing that it shows him? His sin. Because when we see just a glimpse even of who God really is, Wow, such a great divide. I am a sinful person and God is so holy. That, that literally means he is set apart from all sin. And then, then built up within him is a desire to say, oh, Lord, I've got to deal with this sin and I want some of that. I want to be a little bit like you. Think of uh, Peter when he was in the, <clears throat> in the ship with uh, the Lord Jesus. And the storm is raging and what's happening. And then the Lord Jesus calms the storm. And Peter, having seen a glimpse of the authority and the power of God, do you remember what he says? He says, depart from me. I'm a sinful man. Because, you know, just a glimpse of who God is shows us our sin and says, I don't want anything to do with that. Lord, would you help me to be holy? Would you help me to be set apart from sin? That's what it means to have a fear of God. That's what it means to fear the Lord. By the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. That's the first thing that's going to keep us there in that place of blessing. Keep us there where God wants us to walk and live our lives. If we, if we were to turn back to Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 29, and, and this is maybe one of the sad verses in Scripture, but God himself says of Israel, oh, that there was such an heart in them, that's the people of Israel, that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always, that it might be well with them and with their children forever. He says, I wish they would always just fear me. They don't. We don't. But oh, that we would. And that's the desire of God. And he just spells it out like that. And he says, you know, there's, there would be nothing greater then if my people would have a reverence for me that resulted in a hatred of sin and a love for holiness. Mm. And that's what we need. And, and that's, that's, a, that's a desire that we ought to have. Why is it important to fear the Lord? Well, the next chapter, Deuteronomy 6, verse 24, says that we ought to fear the Lord our God for our good always that he might preserve us alive. Mm. You know, there's a, there's a preserving factor that's, that's um, associated with this fear of God. Uh, and, and it's a whole other study if you want to go through Scripture and look at all the promises that God has made to them that would fear him. That's a place of blessing, the one who chooses to fear God. Proverbs 13, verse 6, along the same vein, righteousness keepeth him that is upright in the way, but wickedness overthroweth the city, the sinner. There's something about that choice to depart from sin and to choose to live a righteous and a holy life that keeps someone, that keeps us. You don't want to get caught in the breakers of the waves out there. We'll choose to fear the Lord. Choose to swim between the flags. So that's the first thing, fear the Lord. And then as we, as we look through uh, our passage In Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse number 17. He warns them, if thine heart turn away, so that thou wilt not hear. So that you will not hear. And so if F was fear the Lord, L, point number two, is listen to his word. Because the challenge here was, when you choose not to hear, you remove yourself from the place of blessing. So we need to be careful to listen to the word of God. Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 33 says, Whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from fear of evil. What does it mean to hearken? Literally means to hear intelligently. Because sometimes we hear, we hear something and it's gone. In one ear and out the other. 
but to hearken or to hear intelligently means you are saying, and then I'm processing and acting on what you've said. And so what God is saying about his word is when we hear it or when we absorb it, take it in and then act on it. And he says that will keep you between the flags. Listen to his word. Don't be like Israel who chose that they would not hear. And Moses warned them. He said, if you choose not to hear, you will be drawn away and you will worship other gods and you'll serve them. And that's exactly what happened. And so if, if we are looking at our life and we say, Lord, I want to honor you. Lord, I want to walk with you until the day that you take me to be with you. How can I do that in the best possible way? And he says, well, first of all, would you fear me? Second, would you listen? Would you hearken to my word? Be obedient. You know, in scripture, it's very hard to, when it talks about hearing in the word of God, it is very, very closely associated with obedience. Uh, sometimes it's very hard to, to separate the two. Uh, and the word obey literally means to hear under. And so it, it means that I am hearing and then submitting myself to. And that's what God wants with his word of his children, to hear it and then place ourselves under it, submit ourselves to it, to be obedient. And, and again, there's that, there's a path of blessing to those that keep the word of God. In Luke eleven twenty eight, 28, he said, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. He said, that's the path of blessing. Those who act on what the word of God tells them to do. Those who hear intelligently. Scripture also says in Hebrews 13, verse 17, obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves. Why is this important? For they watch for your souls. And I think that's something that's very important, that sometimes we see things in the word of God that we need to submit to. There are people that God appoints in our lives that we ought to submit to. And we say, why? God says, hey, that's the path of blessing. They are watching for your souls. And I think that's probably something we don't think about as often as we should. There is someone, either the, the either God by his spirit himself through his word or using someone appointed in a place of authority to help us stay between the flags, to warn us, hey, if you go out there, there's a rip. I can see. You, you might not be able to see that, but I can see that. And if you wander over there, it's going to be a rough ride. It's going to be a long way back. So obey them that have the rule over you. Take the word of God. Submit yourself to it. Listen. Hearken. So F, we, first we want to fear the Lord. Second, we want to listen to his word. And then number three, if we look in verse number 20 of, of our text in Deuteronomy chapter 30, it says that thou mayest love the Lord thy God, thou mayest obey his voice, there that's that listening, and that thou mayest cleave unto him, cleave unto him. And, and for A this morning, we have abiding Christ, abiding Christ, cleave unto him. Now, cleave is a funny word. We can take a meat cleaver and we can chop a piece of meat in two. But to cleave means to glue together, to hang on to something so tightly that nothing could ever separate you, to be welded together. And what Moses is encouraging the people of Israel to do says, yes, fear God, yes, love him, listen to him, but attach yourself so closely to him that nothing could ever separate you. Where's that place of blessing? Right by the side of our Lord Jesus Christ. We know the verses in John chapter 15 and verse number four, our Lord says, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. And what he's saying there is everything that you need for life, where's it found? 
It's found in Christ. And so there's got to be an understanding that everything that I need for life, I go to Christ and I find it there. I don't need to look elsewhere. I need to attach myself to him. And that, uh, where were we in verse number 20 of Deuteronomy 31? It doesn't just say cleave unto him, but then it says cleave unto him. Why? For he is thy life. Mm. It's exactly this right there. All the nutrients, all the support that you need, they come from that vine, from the Lord Jesus Christ. So everything that I need to support me in life, the Lord Jesus Christ says, I'm here. I'm willing to give it. You need to allow me to let it to flow into you, but you need to attach yourself to me, cleave to me. For I am your life. That's what he says. So where's that place of blessing? It's there, abiding in Christ. And similarly to that in, in Isaiah chapter 26, you can turn there if you'd like, Isaiah chapter 26, verses 3 and 4. We probably know these verses off by heart. But Scripture says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. Now, that word there, stay, I often thought that word meant like fixated on, concentrated. So have our mind concentrated on Christ, but it means so much more than that. It's the same word that uh, is used in the Old Testament for when Aaron was to take the lamb that was approved to be sacrificed and would take his hands and lay it there on his head, thereby transferring all of his sin and the sins of the people to that animal. That's what it means to be stayed. So when, when the scripture says that our mind ought to be stayed on him, what that means is that I can not only receive all of the blessing and the nutrients I need from God, but then I can rest all of my problems, all of my cares, and all of my troubles back on him. That's a pretty special thing. That's what it means to abide in Christ. It means that he sustains me. I'm leaning on him. That, that's a pretty wonderful thing. The Lord says there, that's the path of blessing. As we understand, dear Lord, I need to come to you for everything that I need. And Lord, you can hold me up. Keep our minds stayed on him, abide in Christ. That's A. Point number four. We come to G in our acrostic of flags. G is gaze on Christ. Gaze on Christ. Look there in our text again. Uh, let me find it, sorry. <clears throat> Verse 17 again. It says, but if thine heart turn away. Yeah. And Moses took these people and he said very carefully, be very careful. It is so easy to lose your focus. It's so easy to allow your heart to go after so many other things. Yeah. And our focus starts to shift, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And it wasn't all that long before theirs did. They were so keen to enter the promised land. And then they get somewhat bad report. Off. And then all throughout the history that we have recorded in Scripture, so often their heart turned away. I wonder how often and how easy it is for our heart to turn away. And to keep our eyes focused on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if we come back to our, we come back to our illustration, swimming there at the beach. Have you ever been swimming for a little bit, and you realise after a little while that maybe you've drifted along? You're just going about doing your thing, catching waves, whatever it is, and then you look up and ooh, I left my towel probably 50 metres down there now, and then I've ended up all the way over here. And so it's it's an important thing that when we're when we're going out for a swim that we just just keep a reference point, so we don't end up too far down the beach, having to work our way all the way back against the current. And this is basically what he's saying here. 
We need a reference point in our lives. And what better one than the perfect example of our Lord Jesus Christ? Does you want to live in a path of blessing? You want to walk in that path of blessing? Focus on Christ. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. That's where our mind should be. That's where our eyes should be as we run this race of life. Looking unto Jesus. And then the following verse. You know what? Sometimes it's going to get hard. And it says, well, consider him, that's Christ, that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. Always bringing it back to Christ. He is the end result and the example along the way. Paul said that he was fighting his way through life. Why? That he might win Christ. Just keeping his eyes in one direction. Focusing on Christ. Because we want to stay in that path of blessing. We want to choose the path of life. We don't want to go off. Sometimes we do. It's a rough ride back. Mm. So gaze on Christ. And then uh, <clears throat> our final point this morning. S, be sensitive. Be sensitive. Back in Deuteronomy in chapter 30, in verse 17, he says, if your heart turn away so that you will not hear this next phrase, but shall be drawn away. This is something that happens slowly but progressively being drawn away. And so we're reminded to be sensitive because when we're out there swimming, you're going to feel if there's a little bit of undertow and you're going to account for it. You're going to see if there's a little bit of a rip and you're going to prepare for that. You're going to be aware of what's going on. You're going to be careful. Okay, here's a pitfall that could take me and I'm going to be very careful about how I navigate. What do we need to, as believers, to be sensitive to so that we aren't drawn away? Well, first of all, we need to be sensitive to the Spirit of God because we understand as believers we all possess the Spirit of God. That's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Uh, I was uh, discipling some of the uh, young uh, teenagers that come to our church, and some were saved, some weren't, so we're just going through. And, and praise the Lord, one of them called on the Lord uh, just last Friday. And, and as we, we went through and he was, he was crying and it, and it was just a blessing to see he was overcome with guilt, understood salvation, and he just accepted. And then I was able to, to uh, walk him through what that means for him. That means that the spirit of God is now dwelling within him. And that was an exciting thought for him. He's got some help now. He doesn't have to do it all on his own. And that's the whole point of this message here this morning is that we don't have to forge our way through life all on our own. Someone has marked out the course. That's a blessing. But we need to be sensitive to the spirit as he gives us instruction. It just as I don't know if you've ever been out there swimming, the lifeguard says, hey, just come back in a bit. There's something over there. Uh, we had it once where they said, you know, there's, there's been um, stingrays over there. Maybe just swim over that side a little bit. Because they can see it from the tower. I can't see it when it's right there. So be sensitive to the spirit. Scripture says that in 1 Thessalonians 5.19, we can quench the spirit. Sometimes he's trying to do something and he's put within us a desire to get into his word and to be with God's people and to love God. And we, no, and we squash that. He says, don't do that. Is for your benefit. He's working in you to keep you in the path of blessing. Not only can we quench the spirit, but in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, scripture says that we can grieve the spirit. He set out these boundaries and said, Don't do that. You're free to if you want to, but don't. It won't be good for you. And sometimes we go, No. And we do it anyway. And how many times have we done that where we willingly choose to go our own way? That's why David said, oh, Lord, would you keep me back from presumptuous sin? I don't want to choose to sin against you. Knowingly reject. And yet we do. So we need to be sensitive to the spirit as he works in our heart. But not only to the spirit, we also 
the need to be sensitive to Satan because first Peter 5 verse 8 Peter there says be sober be vigilant because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour but not only within me is there the potential to sin but there's also someone out there who wants me to fall uh, he can't remove my salvation from me that's secure but he can take me from this path of blessing he can entice me away he can entice me not to choose life, but to make the other choice. He says, be aware, be sensitive, because you will be drawn away. And that's what Moses was saying there. That's not, that's not something that happens straight away. It's a gradual process that takes me away. And before long, the flag's away over there. And I'm out here all on my own. So he says, be sensitive. So to the spirit, to Satan, but also I need to be sensitive to self. Jeremiah 17 verse 9 says, the heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked. Who can know it? And he says that in the context of the one who thinks he's honoring and serving the Lord. Our heart is going to tell us all is well. We are forging forward for the Lord. And he says, be very, very careful. Your heart wants you to think that. It's not always the case. And I know that in my life, I think we all know it. If we were really to take stock, and that's why our brother got us this morning before we, part, uh, before we had communion, just take a moment, examine yourself. Where are we at? Is my heart deceiving me? Or is there something that I need to bring before the Lord? And it's that easy, isn't it? Confess, he will forgive. What a wonderful blessing. It's not very hard. But that deceit is real. So be sensitive to self. James chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. Scripture says every man is tempted. They're not tempted of God, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. And they're both there in the present tense. This is a, this is a very gradual but continual process of being drawn away allowing my own lusts to roam free and to meet with the temptation of sin and boom there sin is conceived and if we let that go it brings ruin so we need to be sensitive to self we have a very deceitful heart he says hey you want to you want to live in a place of blessing as we as we move forward trying to draw closer to the lord every Every day, be sensitive. So first, fear the Lord. Listen to his word. Abide in Christ. Gaze on Christ. Keep him as our focus. And let's be sensitive as we walk. So we want to swim between the flags. We want to live in that place of blessing that our God has mapped out for us. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and then pastor if you can. Our Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you that you have not just saved us and then left us to fend for ourselves uh, but lord you desire that we walk with you you desire that we choose life that we choose blessing we choose to walk with you but lord help us not to choose to walk away from you lord help us not to choose anything uh, but to desire to be uh, as close as we could ever be to you lord it's a wonderful thing to have fellowship with our god uh, lord i pray that you would have uh, your hand of blessing over our time of fellowship now uh, and over the service this afternoon. Lord, we look to you in Jesus' name. Amen.